distinguished audience, among whom are Honorable Chief Justice of Karnataka, Honorable Chief Justice Designate, former judges of the Supreme Court, current judges of the Supreme Court, judges of the High Court, Honorable former Chief Minister, Honorable Ministers, former Ministers, and all the loved ones. I have the joy this morning to introduce multifaceted expert to this esteemed audience. He was, at the age of 12, ordained as a Parsi priest. He did his, he did his schooling in Mumbai, law from campus law center Delhi, then masters in law from Harvard Law School. Thesis being affirmative action, a comparison between Indian and US constitutional law. He practiced maritime law as a trainee in New York. Then he began his journey in Supreme Court of India. Recognizing his outstanding merit was designated as a senior advocate at the age of 37 by amending Supreme Court rules which mandated his minimum age of 45 years. He has over 500 reported Supreme Court judgments appearing as an advocate. He was appointed as Solicitor General of India in 2011. He was one man army. In 2014, he was directly elevated as judge of Supreme Court from Bar, becoming only the fifth direct elevatee. As a judge, he was sharp, brusque, and fearless. He was one with absolute integrity, marked by phenomenal memory. He was sui generis on the bench. He deeply cared for justice through root of law. With his expertise in commercial and constitutional matters, he authored 360 judgments on diverse subjects. He was one of the finest judges in the history of Supreme Court. A few notable among the many judgments are Muhammad Arif's case, where he has held that in cases imposing death penalty, a review should be held, heard in open court. Shreya Singhal's case, his commitment to the right to free speech on internet is noticeable. In Shaira Banu's case, he developed the concept of manifest arbitrariness for declaring a law to be unconstitutional. That's the practice of instant triple talaq. In privacy case of Justice K.S. Puttaswamy, recognizing right to privacy as a fundamental right under Article 21 of the Constitution of India. He has been recognized as one of the five world heroes by Access International Human Rights Organization for his judgment in K.S. Puttaswamy's case. In Navtej Singh Johar, he dealt with constitutionality of Section 377 of the IPC. In Joseph Shine's case, he dealt with constitutionality of criminal offense of adultery. He was selected by Harvard Alumni Association for interview with three distinguished alumni worldwide in December 2020. The, this included uh, Robinson, former pres uh, president of Ireland, and Hisashi Owado, former president of International Court of Justice. He was one of the signatories in the world, in the worldwide towards global ethics, a document of Parliament of World Religions. He has, in addition, authored three books, The Inner Fire, Faith, Choice, and Modern Day Living in Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism in, is the other faith, in, a, in other faith, discordant notes 
the voice of dissent in the court of last resort. His other interests include passion for deep knowledge about Western classical music, and a reader of history, philosophy, literature, comparative religion, enjoys nature walks. He has given many lectures, and the lectures vary from such varied topics uh, to name a few, he has spoken about music, he has spoken about great dissenters of Supreme Court, federalism and constitution, he has spoken about any topic under the sun, his knowledge is, is vast. He is a cultured man, knowledgeable, proficient, wide range of subjects. He is a quintessential Renaissance man. With this, I introduce, according to me, the genius of our times, Justice Rowington Fali Nariman. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, may we now pray for your words. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and please welcome Honorable Justice R.F. Nariman, sir. Thank you, Prabhu. Justice Shivraj Patil, Swamiji. My dear friend, Justice Santosh Hegde. Justice Gopal Gauda, Chief Justice. Judges of the High Court. Other dignitaries. This remarkable book tells us about a remarkable man. It is amazing as to what exactly Justice Patil has come through and come through with flying colors. Just imagine, he lost his mother when he was only two. He went through severe poverty, studied under candlelight, did exceptionally well, did so well that he then became president of his students' union. He was then a judge of several high courts, including Karnataka, Madras, and finally the Chief Justice of Rajasthan. After which, in natural succession as it were, he came up to the Supreme Court. I remember him with the greatest affection, personally, because his was one of the best benches any lawyer could ever appear before. He was a man who was always courteous. I do not ever, I do not remember ever having seen him lose his temper. He was firm. He was polite. He grasped the point immediately. And he decided as early as possible. So in every way, an absolutely ideal judge. I wish he could have stayed on for life. <laughs> However, he demitted office at the early age of 65, as all of us must, and then went on to be a member of the National Human Rights Commission, where he did very good work. It is most unfortunate that when he was appointed Loka Yukta, that he stepped down in 45 days. He should never have stepped down. Scurrilous attacks will come and will go. Your reputation goes on forever. There's no question. And I only wish he had stayed because the human service that Justice Hegde did to this state, I know. And I'm sure you would have followed in his august footsteps. You would have also done a great service. But unfortunately, it was not to be. In the book, there are many interesting references, and I'll come out with a few of them. He speaks of Justice Venkata Chalaya. Now, there's a very interesting incident which took place when Justice Patil was a lawyer, and Justice Venkata Chalaya was in a division bench. And apparently, as happens all the time, 
he was banging his head against a wall and he was told in unceremonious terms that he was wrong. The day ended and the next day with the grace that only Justice Venkatacharya and he have. Justice Venkatacharya started the proceedings by telling him that as a matter of fact, the bench had not been right. The bench was wrong. And that they ought to have listened to Mr. Patil and that Mr. Patil's argument was absolutely correct. I have myself also had an experience of a similar kind with Justice Venkatacharya. Justice Venkatacharya was sitting in court number three before he became Chief Justice with Justice R.C. Patnaik. And he had just decided, authoring a judgment for a constitution bench, that expenditure tax was leviable by the union under the residuary entry. Because as all of you know, we have three lists. We have a union list, we have a state list, we have a concurrent list. And if any matter falls outside any of these lists, including a tax, it will fall within the residuary entry and a tax can then be imposed by the union. The argument made by our side was that expenditure tax is nothing but a luxury tax, which is covered by entry 62 of the state list. Justice Venkatacharya decided against us saying that when you take the aspect doctrine, which is something that he borrowed from the Canadian cases, viewed from the expenditure aspect, it would fall under the residuary entry. And viewed from a different luxury aspect, it would fall under entry 62, this two. At that time, the expenditure tax was 10%. Shortly after, Parliament raised it to 20%. And our clients went to court, filed an Article 32 petition. And naturally, it was posted before Justice Venkatachalaya and as I told you, Justice Patnai. My father led our side. I had done some research. And I was very keen to show that some aspects of that judgment were not quite correct. And I was hoping that my father would point this out, but he didn't. So as soon as Justice Venkatachala looked at him and said, there's very little for you to say now, he agreed and sat down. I must have looked quite aghast because he noticed it. And it is amazing, he called for me. And this time he called for only me. There was a big team. He didn't call for anybody else at 2 o'clock on the same day. And he said, I noticed, Mr. Nariman, there was some discomfiture. Was there something that you wanted to say? So I was young then and I blurted out, I said, yes. So he said, uh, are you telling us that our judgment is wrong? So I said, yes, in my, in my enthusiasm. And he said, oh, please tell us. So I spoke about how I found some passage in Lefroy, Canadian constitution and said that when you look at aspects, you have to have an entry versus an entry. You can't have entry versus residuary, nothingness. And I also tried to point out that the aspect doctrine was nothing but pith and substance, which is another, another very well-known doctrine when legislation is challenged as falling within one entry or another. So he immediately recalled the order he said, I'm very interested in what you have to tell me. Please give me a written submission on the next occasion and he issued notice. Now, the next occasion unfortunately never came because Parliament withdrew 20% and it went back to 10%. But I only want to tell you that I had a very similar experience. And it is amazing that any judge would be willing to listen to a junior counsel on how wrong his judgment is. And he was so genuinely interested that he wanted me to give him a written note. Just imagine, these are amazing experiences in one's life. So much for the great Justice Venkatachala, who we all revered. We then come to a very interesting story 
told of a famous Chola king, Manu Nidhi Chola. Now, in those days, apparently, he had a bell which any member of the public could ring for instant justice. And we are told in this story that it was not rung for some time because justice was beaten out all the time. We are also told that after a long time, he gave birth to a son who became the heir apparent and that the heir apparent grew into a fine man. But ultimately one day, that bell rang again. And this time it rang because a cow stepped on the bell and asked for justice, stating that its calf had been run over by the crown prince. Now, the moment this was brought to the notice of the king, the king immediately told his minister to put the crown prince under a particular carriage so that he would also die in the same manner. The famous Hammurabi's code, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The minister, of course, refused to do this and committed suicide. Now, having done this, the king himself then said, I have to meet out this justice and saw that the crown prince was indeed crushed under a chariot. So remorseful was he that he was about to take his own life after that. When the Lord himself came down, saved his life and brought back all of those who were done away with. So this is one again very interesting story. And the statue of this great king embodying justice of this kind is outside the Madras High Court. Another famous statue is also spoken of, of Justice Bhutu Swami Ayer, who was the first Indian ever to be made a High Court judge. Now imagine, he was made in the year 1877. That year is an amazing year because that is the high noon of the British Raj, of the British Empire. Queen Victoria had reigned as a Queen of England for 40 years and as Empress of India for 20. Lord Lytton was then the Viceroy, one of the strict, difficult English versus native Viceroys. In fact, he was responsible for the Vernacular Press Act of 1878 and the Arms Act also of 1878 in order to curb native activities. Now, at this point, for an Indian to become a judge of a chartered high court was well nigh impossible. Somehow or the other, this man was such a genius that he was picked up and made a judge. One other very interesting fact is that the Hindu newspaper as we know it today was founded because there were scurrilous attacks against this judge by the Anglo-Indian press. And the Hindu wanted a voice for India to speak up for this great son of India. So this is the other great statue that adorns the Madras High Court which Justice Shivraj Patil spoke about. Now, apart from this, there's another very interesting story told about a Chipko movement in the state of Rajasthan. There were some 363 tribals, most of them women, who stuck to a certain tree because it was sought to be cut down by the then ruler, Abhaisi, of Jodhpur. And mind you, the date was 9-11, 11th September 1730. There are some dates like this, which I would call Panvati dates in history. Another great Panvati date is 30th January. You will find that not only did our, the father of our great nation, not only was he martyred on that day, but King Charles I lost his head on that day in 1649, as also Hitler came to power on that day in 1933. So 9-11 was the date on which this Chipko movement took place. These poor people were massacred. But then at least after the massacre, the king was most remorseful 
and promised that he would never ever be ecologically destructive again. So this is one other very interesting matter that Justice Patel adverts to. Among the many judgments that he wrote, one stands out, at least for me, as a constitutional lawyer, the judgment in Ashok Tadwar's case. Now, the question was a seemingly simple question with a seemingly simple answer. It was as to whether under the Consumer Act, when a, the Chief Justice of a state had to be consulted in order to appoint the President of the State Commission, whether an acting Chief Justice would fit. Now, this was answered by Justice Patil saying yes, but then he laid down in very felicitous, uh, felicitous words how we have rejected the doctrine which is called originalism. Now, originalism is a doctrine which has gained some acceptance now in the United States, which is to freeze the Constitution in point of time, find out what the Founding Fathers would have said, and if they were clear as to what they were going to say, then that was the end of the matter. And the only way in which you can move forward then is to amend the Constitution. Now, two very interesting quotations are to be found in that judgment. One by the great Justice Jackson in Youngstown Tube Company versus Sawyer, where he specifically says, against originalism, what our forefathers envisaged must be divined from materials almost as enigmatic as those which were the dreams that Joseph was called upon to interpret by Pharaoh. This was one very beautiful quote. And the other was by Dean Roscoe Pound, where he said, please don't construe a constitution as a last will and testament, lest it become one. So this is one of his most outstanding judgments. He then moves on to a very interesting thing that happened at a Johannesburg conference in 2004. He addressed the conference after several judges from the Commonwealth countries had done so. And he told them that in India, even a constitutional amendment can be struck down on substantive as opposed to procedural grounds. And he told them about our great judgment in Keshavananda Bharti's case. It is very, very important to remember that basic structure which is being challenged by some today has come to stay. Some have said that basic structure is today a doctrine which very, with questionable antecedents because it doesn't ground itself in the constitution. It's completely wrong. Basic structure really emanates from the statements that were made by the Attorney General at that point of time, Mr. Nirende, and the great Homi Sirve, who was then the Advocate General of Maharashtra, appearing for the state of Kerala. When asked, they both made a statement which was recorded by the bench. And the statement was that whatever the word amend means in Article 368, it cannot include a repeal of the Constitution. This is very, very important. Now, moving from there, if it doesn't include a repeal, the immediate question then is, all right, that something of the Constitution has to be left. What is that something? And when we are speaking of our Constitution, we are speaking of a living document which is meant to endure through the ages. So, if there are certain principles which are basic to its existence, which you find in the preamble and elsewhere, for example, the fact that we are a sovereign democratic republic, could it be said that by amendment, we cease to be sovereign? We hand back the state, let's say, to the British Crown. Or that we cease to be democratic? We now have a form of government which is totalitarian or that we cease to be a republic. In fact, interestingly, 
One of the examples given by a Heidelberg professor, Dieter Conrad, was that, can you say that under the Indian constitution, you can now revert to monarchy and get rid of an elected president? Dieter Conrad wrote, because the Weimar constitution was used to destroy itself by Hitler when he came to power. And after World War II, Germany then had a constitution which made it clear that certain basic rights could not be touched by amendment. So this professor argued in 1965 in an article, long before Kesavananda Bharti, that there have to be limitations which one reads into a constitution document, which he called implicit. There are explicit limitations which you find which are procedural limitations under Article 368. But there are implicit limitations which you find with the word amend. And he came out with four stark examples to show that you cannot undermine basic values of the Constitution. One example I have just given you. The other example was could you take away democracy by abolishing Article 21, which, as you know, guarantees life and personal liberty against state action? He also then went on, as I told you, to say that can we revert to being a monarchy? He then said, most tellingly, suppose the power to amend procedurally which is now two-third and two-third of both houses, present and voting, be taken away and be given to the president, to the executive. Or indeed, if I may add, you go the other way, make the country a dictatorship, and then say, we abolish Article 368, you can't amend at all. Now, all these examples were given only in order to show that when a constitution has certain basic values which reflect themselves in the preamble and in the basic document itself, those values cannot be robbed in their entirety. And that is what basic structure basically is. I am so glad Justice Patil spoke in defense of basic structure. Because when basic structure is attacked, people tend to forget two very basic things. That just after it was laid down by a razor-thin majority of seven to six, the Constitution 39th Amendment Act, which in essence made the then Prime Minister above the law, was struck down by a Constitution bench consisting of four judges who were minority judges in Kesavanandabad. So the minority judges realized when they used Kesavananda Bharti's basic structure that they were wrong in deciding that there is no implied limitation on the power to amend. Otherwise, the Prime Minister would have been above the law and the 39th Amendment would not have been struck down. Another thing they don't remember is that basic structure has come to stay. The 44th Amendment which undid large parts of the 42nd Amendment, has now made it clear that even in an emergency, which may be imposed because of armed rebellion or because of some insurrection or some war outside, Article 21, which was spoken of by Dieter Conrad, cannot be taken away. Now, if it cannot be taken away, it cannot be taken away only because it is so basic to the value of democracy in this constitution that it cannot be taken up. So, thank you, Justice Patil, for having enlightened judges from all over the world as to how important it is to have a basic structure doctrine. <laughs> Apart from this, in a lighter vein, Justice Patil speaks of one of our Chief Justices, Justice Bharucha, and he gives a very interesting incident. <laughs> he said most people were terrified of him, which is correct, 
I was one of those people. I was terrified. And despite that, he was an honest, straight, good man. And the bar gave him a standing ovation when he left. The bar ultimately judges judges, as it is Judge Justice Patil today. And uh, he said that so pervasive was the fear aura of Justice Barucha that at a cricket tournament, when the microphone crackled every time somebody spoke in it, when Justice Barucha spoke, it stopped crackling. <laughs> so even the microphone was terrified <laughs> of Justice Barucha. <laughs> Apart from this, there's a, a lot of good work that Justice Patel has done, which he adverts to. One is in the realm of child marriage. And he had formed a committee, made a report, which report was then accepted. And child marriages were made void in Karnataka. And uh, offences under the Act, together with being offences under POXO, which is a prevention of child uh, sexual offences act. Ultimately, one very interesting thing from the book I must read to you. He spoke at one function of the ten commandments, the biblical commandments, when they apply to a judge. And these are his ten commandments. They are beautiful and I want to put them to you. First commandment, to be a good judge, one must first be a good human being. How right? Absolutely correct. You cannot be a good judge unless you are a good human being. Two, beautiful. Remember you are not divine, but that divine functions are assigned to you. Humility, which he has in abundance. Very, very important. These functions are extraordinary and demand close attention and sensitivity. How right? Three, your oath is your religion. Be true to it. Your conscience is your watchman. Obey it. Four, extend courtesy to others as you would expect it from them. Be polite yet firm in your judgments. I might tell you that he was always firm in his judgment and always polite in speech. Five, Listen patiently and attentively to arguments. This aids in better understanding and writing sound judgments. Six, consider evidence and arguments carefully and objectively. Not doing so will have an adverse impact on the verdict. Seven, use technology but don't become its slave. How correct? Don't surrender your creativity, innovation and original thinking. How correct? Eight, do your best to decide cases early and deliver judgment on the appointed date, keeping in mind that litigants may have been waiting for a long period, as indeed they wait for years and years in this country, unfortunately. Nine, endeavor to find out what is right and where justice lies in a case and not merely who is right between the parties. And ten, maintain good conduct both inside and outside the court respecting principles of justice and human values. Justice Patil, you get 10 on 10. Thank you very much for this beautiful book.